Okay, so um, oh, it's not giving me any pictures. Um, so especially for these uh, pure word descriptions, um, I prefer to doodle as I'm reading the question to make sure that I have all the um, necessary information and that I didn't miss any important information while reading the question. So it says the Olympus moons on Mars is the largest volcano in the solar system. Okay, so we're talking about a mountain. Um, at a height of some kilometers and with a radius of radius of some another kilometers if you are standing on the summit with what initial velocity would you have to fire a projectile from a cannon horizontally to clear the volcano and land on the surface of mars note that mars has an acceleration of gravity okay so we are Mm, my drawing wasn't maybe the best. Let me just adjust it a little bit. Because um, uh, it's not, I mean, you know, it, it, this is a, it, um, it, oftentimes the drawing doesn't have to be to scale, but sometimes when you, your drawing is uh, too far off scale, it can mislead you. I want to make sure I don't do that. So I'm just making sure that, okay. And, Something like this is the picture that I'm imagining for the uh, trajectory of the the projectile that I'm firing horizontally. Um, okay, that seems complete enough. And I think I'm making, I'm going to have to make some assumptions. So um, one, these are quite common assumptions we make when we do projectile motion, um, like assuming that this, uh, what's represented as a flat ground is actually flat. Uh, I mean, you know, Mars is a planet, it has curvature, and somehow I'm going to assume that over a distance of 312 kilometers, that, that curvature is negligible. So I'm not going to worry about the surface of Mars curving away from the point uh, where I'm starting. And the second thing, which I think will be a much better assumption particularly on Mars is we are going to assume that air resistance is negligible. We um, quite often don't spell it out because it's such a common assumption, but it's uh, important to keep that in mind. Um, I guess it, this matters more for lab <laughs> because when you're just working things out on paper, then uh, neg neglecting air resistance makes the solution steps a lot easier. Uh, that's really the main reason we do it. And two, um, very often the results you get with the air resistance neglected are close enough with the fully correct result that takes air resistance into account. It's uh, really when things travel very fast for a long time that air resistance becomes uh, much more significant. So, so with that, um, so I guess um, in this question, what we are given is we are given the range and we are being told, uh, yeah, and we are being asked for how fast does it have to initially move to uh, obtain this range or obtain a range greater than that. Okay, so, um, <laughs> um, so I, I guess we don't really teach you a systematic problem-solving strategy for projectile motion. The place I like to start is um, writing down equations that involve the unknowns with the knowns. So one of the relationships that would relate this unknown velocity to the known range would be the uh, the thing that says um, the displace or distance or displacement is given by velocity times duration of time. Or uh, you've seen some versions of this equation. So, so that's what I would start out with. Uh, the, in terms of the expressions that we know, the displacement here that I'm thinking of would be range. Uh, I see something in the... Um, Something in the chat, let's see, assume the shape is a volcano is lower than the... Yeah, we do have to assume that, yeah. It's, uh, it's 
going to be very likely. Well, <laughs> so yes, um, you you are having to assume that the volcano is forming some kind of a plateau like this. Like if that were the case, yeah, we could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, and there there are those assumptions that go in. So back to this equation. So we know that displacement that we are looking for the uh, the horizontal displacement of range R. And uh, let me change the label for time. Let me call this the final time, T final. And when you look at this equation, um, so this is the check I like to do as I'm writing down these relationships. At some point, I'm going to have enough information to solve the problem. So the the way you know when you have enough information is you do that by counting, um, counting, yeah. sorry. You do that by counting um, number of unknowns, which is something that you have to solve for, number of unknowns in your equations, and you count the number of equations. When you have enough information to solve your system of equations, this should be equal. And it's, I think, something that comes from algebra somewhere. So, um, so here, I look at my equation, one equation, and I count two unknowns. I don't know the velocity that I'm firing this at, and I don't know the time at which this lands. Oh, and I guess when I wrote down this equation, I implicitly assumed that the x component of velocity is constant, which it is, because it's a projectile motion, <laughs> and acceleration in the x direction is zero, and acceleration in the y direction in this case will be minus 3.7 meters per second squared. And this is a very common situation that you will come across in projectile motion questions that time will be a useful piece of information to have and that you don't have it. And this is a situation where you use the motion in the vertical direction, in the y direction to get another equation that involves time. You can solve for time and um, finish the solution. So, um, so let me write down that um, kinematics equation back from the textbook. <laughs> Um, that involves the vertical motion, and one of these will be useful. And I will tell you, it, uh, um, it'll help your problem solving steps go faster if you have this memorized. But if you don't have that memorized, you can just look at it when you, um, <laughs> when you get to this point in problem solving strategy. And I'm looking for one of these equations that involve time and hopefully doesn't involve any additional unknowns. So this equation is an, um, it fails the second point because it's involving two different y velocities. And I think I can say at the initial, at the top, the y velocity is zero, but this is going to be a second unknown and I don't want that. And this has the same problem. It has the second unknown. So this equation looks more promising because it involves time. And it only involves the initial y velocity, which I think I know. And this equation, it doesn't work for me because it doesn't involve time. So I'll use this equation um, so that so that I'm involving an additional equation without involving additional unknowns. Now for Questions that are harder to solve, sometimes you have to go through multiple steps like this. Uh, you might be introducing a new equation that introduces additional unknowns that then you can solve for. <laughs> so it, again, um, it, it, uh, it, the best way to learn to navigate all that is to practice because depending on the question, it can vary quite a bit. So let me rewrite a version of this in terms of the quantities that we have. We have a height, so I'm gonna, oh wait. So this is gonna be my initial height. So that's my y naught. Um, and my initial y velocity, I know that's zero because it's only going horizontally. So my initial y velocity here is zero. So zero times time, 
minus one half and i'll use the letter g uh, i'll just uh, say this is minus g for while we are on mars i'll just remember that to plug in 9.8 uh, g times time squared uh you write right one time um oh and the one quantity that i need to nail down is y so um i drew this line at the beginning and uh set my y equal to zero here because uh, and it's with this axis that i can describe my initial position as h so my final so my y position at time t final is going to be zero so this is my second equation that um and looking at this i only have one unknown t final and that's something that i've already counted so with these two equations, one and two, I now have two equations, two unknowns. I finally have enough information to solve for my unknowns. And so from here, you just solve through it. The uh, rest is algebra. But one caution I will give you, because this is the practice that you will have to get into, solving for a system of equations. And as you are solving for this system of equations, the main thing you want to watch out for is the, the final quantity that you are interested in is the initial x velocity. You actually don't care about the time. And uh, sometimes people get uh, tunnel vision. <laughs> you think, oh, I need to know my velocity. So let me solve this for my velocity. When you do that, um, what you, I think it this, in this question, the danger of that is a bit smaller, but sometimes what you can end up doing is the quantities that you solve for. So here, when you solve for Vx is equal to R divided by T final, and the reason I was saying in this question, there is no danger of this is because the second equation doesn't involve a V of X at all. So you're fine. <laughs> But in the other questions where the second equation involves this quantity of interest, if you use this to plug it into the other equation, then um, you have eliminated the Vx from your system of equations and you don't have a way to get the Vx in a single step. So the most efficient way to solve for system of equations like this is to keep in mind which is the quantity that you are interested in and solve for, for that last. Because up, up until the very last step, all the variables that you will be solving for, you are solving for them in order to eliminate them. So I, I will solve my second equation so that I can eliminate T final from my um, other equations. So let me just write down the simplified version here. I'm going to move this over to the other side. One half G T final squared is equal to zero times that is zero. So I just have H. Let me solve for T final. That's equal to two H over G square rooted. Um, so now I use this to eliminate T final from my other equation. So, so when you're solving for a system of equations, that's a, what you are doing. So, uh, so you want to be deliberate in uh, what algebra step you decided to do next. So Vx is equal to R divided by square root of 2H over uh, quote unquote G. It's a different G than usual. Um, let me plug in all the numbers. Now, when you are plugging in numbers for questions like this, one word of caution, um, you want to make sure that you uh, watch the unit. <laughs> uh, my g, uh, gravitational acceleration, that's given in meters. So I want all the other lengthy units to be in meters as well. That way things will cancel out and I don't have to. Yeah. So so let me enter range as 312,000 meters divided by, um, let me open parenthesis, um, 2 times h, 26.5 uh, times 1,000, so 26,500 kilometers um, divided by the gravitational acceleration, 3.7 meter per second squared, uh, close parenthesis, and then square root. 
Okay, so that should be the square root of the quantity when I say equals. That should be 26. Really? That seems super big, huh? 26, uh, 100 and, uh, let me round it to 10 um, meter per second. And if you work it through the units, you should get the unit of meter per second. Um, okay, 26, 10 uh, meter per second. Yeah, so if this war on Earth, this probably is fast enough where neglecting air resistance is not a good thing. But uh, Mars has, uh, I think the, the atmosphere of Mars is 1% or 0.1% of Earth. So uh, this might actually be still, um, it might still be a good approximation to neglect air resistance. In any case, we're not having to explicitly deal with air resistance.